Good morning and welcome to Restore. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jodie and I'm part of the Restore family. And if you journeyed through COVID with us, then this setup is very similar. Um, it's strange to be talking to you again once more from my front room, um, but my diary or our diaries wouldn't allow for me to record in Woodford this week. So here I am in my home, which means we run the risk of the dog barking, of the doorbell ringing, of the neighbors shouting. Uh, so hopefully we won't have too many major disruptions, but if we do, we'll just roll with them. Uh, but good to be together today as we continue our series of The Spirit Speaks and looking at prophecy in particular. So I just want to pray for us before we before we start, before we look at the word and say whatever a posture of prayer is for you, then why don't you just take that up right now. It might be eyes closed, hands out, I don't know. Um, but let's just focus in on uh, Father God before we before we look at his word. Father God, thank you that you are active, you are alive, you're present, and that you speak. And today, as we, as we look at the gift of prophecy, Father, I pray that we would have ears to hear as you speak to us today. Lord, may we have greater revelation of who you are and go deeper in relationship with you today. Lord, thank you that you are speaking. I pray we'd hear you today. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, this week I was travelling up to Birmingham uh, with a couple of friends, acquaintances, I guess. And as we were travelling, they asked me kind of how I came to faith and uh, kind of my faith journey and about following Jesus. And as I was sharing my story, uh, it was became, I became really aware that the, the key moments in my walk with Jesus, my following Jesus over the years, have been moments when God has spoken uh, through someone else, through the prophetic. And it really struck me, you know, we can, I can explain my beliefs, I can explain them, but I can't tell my story without the prophetic, without God speaking uh, through someone else. And I just love that God is, like I just prayed, alive and active and present and speaking not just in history, but right now and right now today as we gather together. You know, God speaks to us through his living word, through Jesus. God speaks to us through scripture, the written word. And God speaks to us, as we're looking at today, through prophecy. And I've done some listening to other people and some research and some thinking as I've prepared for this. And I've based quite a lot of this talk on some great teaching from Bridgetown, uh, which I'm really thankful for. So I just want to be clear right from the start, but kind of when I say the word prophecy, uh, maybe we're all thinking different things. So I just want to uh, use a helpful description that I came across that Bridgetown used that has been used in the teaching that I've been listening to, which for me is really simple and just means you and I both know where we're starting from. So prophecy, um, to hear and speak God's voice on behalf of an in individual or person. To hear and speak God's voice on behalf of an individual or a group. And I also realise that when I say the word prophecy, lots of us react in different ways. There'll be some of us who are longing for the gift of prophecy and say, yeah, let's get on with it, let's get weird. Um, and it's possible to have that hunger, which is really great, but maybe not have the biblical foundation around that for the hunger to be built on. So if that's, if that's you today, then you're in for a treat because we are looking at prophecy through the biblical lens in a big way and how we can grow healthily in that eager desire. Uh, for others, you hear the word prophecy and makes you concerned. Um, and maybe that's because of an unfamiliarity, like don't know what it is, didn't come from a church tradition or church at all where that was talked about. Um, and so like don't know or makes you concerned because you've been in an environment where prophecy has been misused and it's been, um, yeah, it's been almost abusive in some ways or manipulative. And so if that's you, then I just want to say today, kind of, A, I'm really sorry and um, that that's been your experience. And I pray that today uh, there'll just be some healing in that and come to understand the gift of prophecy from God and how incredible it is. And then there may be some of you thinking, I've got no idea what Jodie's gone on about. 
Um, let's just get stuck in because this seems like a very long introduction. Um, but that's the perfect place to start. So we're going to look at prophecy uh, through three lenses. Uh, the first one biblically and then communally together and then personally. So first biblically, which is kind of the biggie. Well, there is no era in biblical history without the prophetic. Um, the Bible with kind of prophecy stripped out is just a story that can't be told, a bit like my own. And uh, So if we look at the very beginning, Genesis 1, uh, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now we've already talked about in the last couple of weeks kind of that word, the Spirit of God. The word that's used there is ruach in Hebrew. And that, that word can be translated to spirit or breath. And so the Spirit of God, the breath of God, was hovering over the unformed chaos. And God was breathing on the unformed chaos. And I love that because it makes it when God's breath touches unformed substance, creation happens. When God speaks, creation happens. He spoke the stars into being, the land, the sea. God the Father creates through the Holy Spirit. And so when God speaks, when his breath goes out, when his spirit goes out, creation happens. And then you jump to Genesis 2 verse 7. And, and then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So last of all, God creates people and something unique happens. God puts his breath into them, into the one that is the image of God. And it set people apart from every other created thing. And so the question is why? Why would God give us his breath, give us his spirit to go on creating, to do exactly what we've seen him doing? The first biblical command is to be fruitful and multiply create rule over creation, work these materials into, an, into something and create. And then, of course, comes the, the Garden of Eden, the Adam and Eve, the, the forbidden fruit, which we call the, you know, the whole scene we call the fall. And so human beings were always meant to be filled with the God's spirit. And that sin, that separation, from God, stole that breath from our lungs in a way. And it brings us to the Old Testament. Like, what is God's story for redemption? Well, he just keeps on speaking. God recreates in the exact same way that he created it in the first place, through his breath and through his spirit. If we look at Numbers 11, uh, verse 24 and 25, it says, So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought seventy together 70 of their elders and made them stand around the tent. Then the Lord God came down in the cloud and spoke with him. And he took some of the power of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but did not do so again. So the way it usually happened for Moses was that when the spirit of God fell in a cloud on Moses, uh, as happened, God would speak with Moses as, as, as a friend, face to face. And then in response, Moses would speak the words of God to the people. He prophesied, he would hear God's voice and on behalf of an individual or group. Remember, that's the, the kind of definition we're using. Prophecy is to hear and speak God's voice on behalf of an individual or group. But in this instance, that same spirit was given to 70 others. And what immediately followed was prophecy. They all began to prophesy. They all began to speak, to hear and speak the words of God to one another. But it says, but they did not do so again. It was temporary. It was it wasn't an ongoing gift. It's a divine moment. And this is the beginning of a pattern where throughout the Old Testament, God takes certain people and communicates with them directly. And then those people share the private whispers of God publicly. And those people are called prophets. But they are the exception and not the rule. So the good news is God keeps speaking to individual people who hear God's voice on behalf of others. The bad news yet is prophecy is not yet common for everyone in the same way. But if you carry on in Numbers 11, there's this beautiful moment, this telling moment, where Moses says in chapter 11, verse 29, he says, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets, 
and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. It's like Moses realises in this moment that his experience of God's nearness is the exception and not the rule. That the very best of what he's experiencing with God is not yet common to all people in the same way. And Moses' longing points out to us that the same spirit speaking prophetically to everyone through the, in the community. He points ahead to that. So this brings us to Jesus. I'm sorry if you can hear the dog snoring, by the way. Um, this brings us to Jesus, who became the word of God, the spoken word of God in human form. And Jesus is a walking, talking, living, breathing prophecy. And after his life, death, uh, death and resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples in John chapter 20, where we read this in verses 21 and 22. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that... He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Here's my breath for your lungs, my ruach, my spirit. He gives to them. Reminds you of Genesis, doesn't it? And then if we keep turning our Bible, we get to Acts, the book of Acts, where the church was founded on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was given just as Jesus had promised. And what immediately happens in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit is given to the people, they all start speaking the words of God. All of God's people start acting like prophets, just like Moses had foretold and desired. And then Peter stands up to explain what's going on to everyone. And he says, what you're seeing right now is exactly what the prophet Joel said would happen. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all your people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So God's promise in the Old Testament, there's a day coming when my spirit, my ruach, my breath won't just be for a one-off appearance, for a special few but it will become common experience of all my people, just as it was always meant to be. And that promise is for children and adults and seniors, for men, for women, for rich, for poor, for black, for white. It's for all people who will receive me and get my voice. What was sensational on the day of Pentecost then becomes normal as the church matures. I'm just going to say that again. What was sensational on the day of Pentecost, everyone speaking God's voice, becomes normal as the church matures. Joel's prophecy in Acts becomes Paul's instruction to 1 first, first Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 it says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging and comfort. And Paul goes on to write in the chapter, I would like all of you to prophesy, which is an identical echo from Moses all the way back in Numbers 11. He says, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets that the church may be edified. He says, all of you. Because all of you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Ruach, with the breath of God. All of you can now carry permanently what the prophets of old had, just for particular times and particular purposes. The prophets, that's why it's called prophecy in the New Testament. It's the ordinary, I can't say that the normal, the ordinary practice of what was extraordinary before Jesus breathed his spirit into us. I think quite often we can get caught up that the prophecy is the, the extraordinary, the sensational. And yet, as we look at the story of prophecy and track it through the Bible, track it biblically through this biblical lens, 
we see it's the normal, ordinary practice of the church that is maturing. Prophecy is an optional sub point. It's the very heart of the story of God. You look at John, Peter, Paul, Mary, Timothy, Priscilla, Apollos, all of them, like lots of us, cannot explain their beliefs apart from scripture and cannot tell their stories apart from prophecy. It's like the foundation of their lives is, is, is God's written word, but the shape of their lives is God's spoken word. And so if the Bible is, is our guidebook for relationship with God, the question isn't, does God speak to me? Because we can see from scripture, he does. The question is, am I listening? Or do I know how to listen? So that is prophecy through kind of a biblical lens, a real whistle-stop tour of kind of the prophetic, right from Genesis, God breathing his breath into us. And then kind of the prophets of old, and then Jesus breathing his breath, and then it becoming commonplace and everyday, normal and ordinary in the church of Jesus. There is lots more to say, but we do not have time today. But I hope that gives you a snapshot of kind of prophecy through the Bible. So let's just talk about now that through the lens communally. So if we think back to 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 14, which I just read a few moments ago, it's almost like it's the biblical manifesto, uh, the biblical vision of the role of prophecy in the local church. And so I want to draw out four words, um, from some four principles from, from that. Uh, one is that I've gone on about already, it's ordinary. Ordinary, intimacy, way, Jesus. We're going to come through those. So those four words. First, prophecy is the ordinary experience of church life. I cannot say that enough. <laughs> Here we have an entire chapter of the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 devoted to how you, to use the gift of prophecy when the church gathers together. So the assumption behind that writing is that when God's people gather, God is speaking through some to others. Prophecy. In fact, the New Testament church receives written instruction directly related to prophecy in the letters of Romans, Corinthians, uh, Thessalonians, Timothy, and in the epistles of Peter, Jude, and Revelation. So it's a clear biblical, biblical expectation that God will speak when the church gathers together. Dallas Willard um, wrote this. He said, if we look at the advice on how um, to the meetings of the church were supposed to proceed as given in 1 Corinthians 14, we see that they assume that numerous people in the congregation are going to have some kind of communications from God which they will be sharing with others in the group. In other words, if you're at church, if you're in the church, if you're part of the church, expect prophecy. Um, I recently um, have been having a bit of a tough time of it. <laughs> Life's not been uh, smooth sailing for me of late. And I won't go into it all now because we don't have time and it's not the place. Um, but I have at times felt really isolated and extremely lonely in it all and not seen. And I didn't really tell people. I have just kind of got on with life. And then just the other Sunday um, at church, someone comes up to me at the end and says, I've, I've got this, I've, seen, I've got a picture from God. And they went on to explain what they saw in this picture and what they sensed God was saying through it. And again, I'm not going to share the whole picture or the whole sense. But the bottom line was, essentially, they said, and I think all of that is to, to say that you are seen and you're not alone in this. I don't know if that resonates with you. I was like, Ooh. <laughs> what is that? That's just another Sunday. It's just another church gathering. That's the normal experience of church life. Someone hearing God's voice and speaking it out on behalf of another individual or the group. It's just every day. It's ordinary. Secondly, prophecy invites intimacy. I just want you to humour me for a second here uh, for an exercise. Can you all close your eyes? Yep, close your eyes just for a moment. Okay, now with your eyes closed, I want you to try to identify the voice, 
that you are hearing? Whose voice are you hearing right now? Okay, open your eyes. It was mine, right? <laughs> it was my voice that you were hearing. How did you know that? Your eyes were closed. You couldn't see my mouth moving. How did you know that? Because you know what now, what my voice sounds like. Now, some of you have been following Jesus way longer than you've been listening to me. So if you know my voice, then you should, should know the voice of the Good Shepherd, the voice of Jesus. Jesus said in John 10, his sheep follow him because they know his voice. And so I said earlier, the question isn't, is God speaking, but am I listening? And that's true, but for any of us that have ever tried to hear God, we, it's not quite that simple, is it? It takes some practice and it can be uncomfortable risking that we've heard God's voice. So how do we learn to hear the shepherd's voice? We, we do our best to follow him when we ask God to speak to us, then we just walk obediently, sometimes only half sure that it's actually God we're hearing. And so I just want to be really honest and say, do you know what? That means mistakes will be made. I have shared words with people that I've thought were from God. And I've said, does that resonate? Does that ring any, or does that, you know, sound like that could be for you? Nope. <laughs> and I've said it to people who have said to me, or does that resonate? I go, not in this, I've tried to be really polite about it. Oh, not, not now, but I'll, I'll pray about it. Sometimes we get it wrong. We run a risk. We think we've heard God's voice and it's only through taking that risk and learning that we become familiar with the voice of God. And so we've got to be willing to get it wrong if we're ever going to get it right. And I think there just needs to be an acceptance of that, that if we're going to take risks and hear God's voice for one another, we may get it wrong at times, but it's okay because we'll get familiar with God's voice as we go along. His voice will become more and more familiar. We just have to not be afraid of being foolish every now and then. And people going, nope, doesn't sound like that was for me. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry about that. In the Bible, God speaks sometimes really obviously, like, this is my son. Um, but of, more often than not, he speaks in a whisper to individuals. And it seems to be that's God's preferred method of communication. Why? I think because... It's intimate. God wants us to lean in close. Not just hear the booming voice, but to lean in close in the ordinary coming and going of our lives. Prophecy is not God's invitation to go travelling around the world wearing a sackcloth. Prophecy is an invitation to come further into relationship with Jesus to become more intimate with God than we're already experiencing, to lean a bit closer, to risk a little bit more and trust the good shepherd and, and take God seriously rather than ourselves. So prophecy is ordinary, intimacy and weigh. We should need to weigh the prophecy. That was the third word I wanted us to remember. So in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 29, it says two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And like in, first, in 1 Thessalonians, it also says to test all prophecies and keep what's good and throw out the bad. And so for those of us receiving the prophecy, the recipient, we should receive it freely, but weigh it carefully. With a discerning ear. And so the discerning ear and kind of the prophetic voice go hand in hand. And weigh a word that we receive against scripture, against Jesus, and against trust. I think those are three really helpful ways. When we receive a, a prophetic word, like, does it line up with scripture? Does it align with what I read in the Bible? Does it align with the character of Jesus? Does it sound like Jesus? Does it sound like something he would say? And then trust. Do I trust this prophetic voice? The New Testament has a lot of warnings about watching out for false prophets. And we know a good life bears good fruit. So, and so does the prophetic word. It emerges from a, a fruitful, trustworthy character. So do I trust this prophetic voice? And I don't think we've probably got loads of time, but 
to go into this, but one of the fears around the prophetic is, is the danger of it. What are we going to do about those who are manipulating it or, or using prophecy for, for not good ways? And I don't know what fully what we can do about that or what I can do about it. What I am going to do is teach us and do this for myself, is, is teach us to weigh the prophet, prophetic word we're receiving, just like the Bible tells us to. The Bible never says, oh, silence the gift of prophecy in case someone messes it up or manipulates it. It says, let's prophesy, let's hear, use the prophetic gift, but let's weigh the prophetic word. Someone said it like this, it says, scripture teaches prophecy, scripture teaches prophecy surrenders to love. That's for the speaker. And we honour the gift by weighing the word and that's for the hearer. So we've got ordinary, intimacy, way, and then Jesus. Finally, prophecy is about Jesus. That's what Jesus said himself. He said, that's what he was getting at on the final night of his life. He said, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. David French writes, the primary role of the prophetic anointing is to reveal God to the human heart. You see, teaching is God using a human voice to tell people about his character. That's what's happening right now. But prophecy is God using a human voice to show people his character. It's one thing to be told and taught that God loves you. Jesus did that too. It's another thing to have that shown to you through the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5 says, God's love is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. So the the Spirit takes biblical truths and then makes them real to us. So my Bible tells me, Scripture tells me that God is El Roy, the God who sees me. But then last sun, the other Sunday, the Spirit showed me that God sees me and made that real to me through the prophetic the scripture teaches that God is love and the spirit makes that real to us. It, it teaches us so much. You, do you hear what I'm saying? We can, we can be taught, but it's the, the revelation of the prophetic, the voice of God, the spirit of God that brings that from here to here. Prophecy directs us towards Jesus. Old Testament prophecy leads up to Jesus and New Testament prophecy points us back to Jesus. Last section, we're almost done. We've looked at prophecy biblically. We've looked at prophecy communally, that it should be ordinary. That it's about intimacy, leaning in, taking risks. It's about weighing the prophetic word that we receive. And it's all about Jesus, pointing us back to Jesus. So what does that mean for you and me personally? If I want to grow in the prophetic, to experience God more and become like a megaphone that he can speak through to others, where do I start? Again, four words that we're going to hang on to. Uh, Desire, ask, encourage and guard. Okay, so first of all, desire. Let's think practically here. Follow the way of love. It's uh, in 1 Corinthians. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the spirit, especially prophecy eagerly desire the gifts of the spirit especially prophecy if you eagerly desire something whether it's a chocolate cake or a holiday or whatever it is if you're like me you're constantly thinking about it you're looking for you know the arrival of it if you're in a even if you're in a cafe like I was this morning in a cafe and you're waiting for your your chocolate cake I wasn't eating chocolate cake but every time that the waitress comes out of the kitchen, oh, is that mine? You're kind of looking for its arrival. And you smell, smell someone else has got it. It's a silly example, but if you're eagerly desiring, it, eagerly desiring it, and you're setting your heart on it, you're deeply committed to it. And um, Paul uses it again and again in, in 1 Corinthians 14. But we, am I eagerly desiring, am I looking for it? Am I thinking constantly about God's small whisper? Am I looking for his arrival in, in, in things? Am I delighting in just the smallest inkling that he's at work, the smallest taste of it? 
I think more often than not in today's church, we eagerly desire teaching, great teaching. And look, I'm all for that. I love preaching and teaching. I've got some favourite preachers and teachers out there, but nowhere in scripture does it read we should eagerly desire the gift of teaching. It's like we have a modern obsession with teaching based on this misconception that, that my words, Jodie's words, are the most important ones we're going to hear today. The most important words spoken in our, in our worship gatherings are those of the teacher. And God doesn't see it this way. The most important words spoken today, the most important voice is God's. We should eagerly desire to hear his voice and God longs to, to pass redemption through one human to another. God doesn't want, want a team with a few star players, a few Christian celebrity speakers. He wants everyone to play. And if we really believed that, we would eagerly desire prophecy to hear and speak God's voice on behalf of another, of an individual or a group. So as we think about that and respond to that, might there be something you want to say today to someone? You've heard from God that you want to speak out to someone through a stumbling risk. Okay, so that's eagerly desire. Secondly, ask. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. The gifts are not something we master. It's not a technique or a skill. It's something we receive. And so if you want an increase in the gift of prophecy, then we ask for it. We pray and we ask or we tell God we want it. Lord, I really would like to receive the gift of prophecy. And tell him why. How will you use it? If he gives you that gift, how we, you know, what does that look like? See, because our motives get picked apart when we start to speak that out to God more specifically. And hopefully our ego gets weeded out a bit so that God can trust us to be the vessel to speak his voice. Prophecy is a gift for building up the church because prophecy surrenders to love. Prophecy is dangerous when it's done by any motive lesser than selfless love. Okay, third, encourage. So prophecy is given to the church for strengthening, encouraging and comforting, it says in scripture. So prophecy and encouragement are really closely related in the New Testament story. So encouragement is prophecy by what you can see. Prophecy is encouragement by what only God can see. So if you want to grow in prophecy, start with your eyes open with what you can see. What have you seen in someone else, admired in someone else, but never actually told them face to face? Well, tell them, encourage them. Encourage them with that thought that's passed through your head but never actually said out loud. If you're desiring prophecy, make a commitment to becoming a person of encouragement because you're on your way. And on the flip side, that guard your mouth. James warns about this. You know, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. And if we want God to use our mouths to build up the kingdom of God, if it, to use our mouths to build up the church, and yet we're casually cursing or making crude jokes or gossiping there's going to be a problem there so if we want God to use our voice to build someone up do not use that same voice to chip away at others if we want God to use our mouths for blessing then make sure we eliminate cursing <laughs> so prophecy is a communal gift and then we practice it communally, not individually. And so I just wonder if together we would commit uh, as a church, as Restore, to practicing prophetic listening and prophetic speaking. To make it the ordinary, to make it the normal, just what happens in church. Not sensational, not extraordinary, not for a special few. But to believe God has breathed his breath, his spirit into each and every one of us. That we can each hear the voice of God and speak it out on behalf of an individual or a group. To take risks, to have a go, to risk getting it wrong and looking like a fool. If you're eager, it's for you. 
If you're nervous, it's for you. If you're terrified, it's for you. If you're sceptical, it's for you. If you're experienced, it's for you. Whoever you are, let's create space to grow in this together. I think the question of the prophetic is confronts us with the question, of what is it we want? Do we want the familiarity that's comfortable but stops short of the common experience we see in the New Testament? Or do we want the mess of hearing God's voice in a maturing community that is founded on love? I think I know what I want. I want to take more risks. I want us to live in the mess of getting it wrong. But based in love, hearing God's voice for one another, that we might build one another up, encourage one another, strengthen one another, and be the church that God longs for us and created us to be. Let's pray. Yeah, Father, thank you that you speak and have done since the beginning of time. And Lord, thank you that you choose to speak to and through each and every one of us. Father, I want to pray for those of us right now. Maybe if this is you, you could just put your, your hand over your mouth as we pray. But Father, I pray for those of us who want to be used by you, to, who want to eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. And we ask for it now, Lord, to increase that gift. Lord, that we might be people who bring, that speak words of life that, and create with our words that you intended. Lord, that we would hear your voice and speak it out to encourage and build up and strengthen and comfort others. Lord, would you give us boldness to take the risk as we follow you and learn to hear your voice together. In Jesus' name, amen.